Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 58, Vertical Farms and Much, Much More with Dick Depomier. This episode of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com forward slash biotech. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would be equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapy? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that might be rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun is the center of the universe, so this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. I'd like to welcome everybody to Futures in Biotech. Um, today, we're uh, very privileged uh, not only to have great guests, but we actually have a, a studio audience, which is our first. Uh, we have uh, Jason uh, Book here. Uh, <laughs> so I feel a little bit like Leo, uh, very uh, honored and uh, pri- privileged to have him listening into the show uh, locally. And we're in Cleveland, so that's a, um, that's a special, uh, <laughs> special trip. Uh, actually, he actually works down the hall and um, he's the. I, no, I noticed he had a Twit logo on his uh, on his, his laptop, which I haven't seen ever um, out here in Cleveland. And uh, that got us to talking. Um, he has a blog, by the way, aliencg.squarespace.com. So you can go check it out. It's swamp gas and moonlight reflections. Um, <laughs> this blog syncs up to the dark side of the moon. So if you want to know what's going on, on the dark side, that's the blog to find out <laughs> now, how he finds out. I don't know, but, uh, that's okay. he's <laughs> an engineer, so they visits. do that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's get to our guests. Oh, well, I'd, I'd like to say hi, have him say hi. Can you turn on your mic? Is it on? Well, thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah, great. Uh, Did I get on there? Or? Thanks for, yeah, I think so. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so let's, let's introduce our guest host next. Um, our guest host has been on the show uh, numerous times, probably too many times to count. And he's a very close friend to the show. His name is Vincent Racniello. He's a professor of microbiology at Columbia University. And he's the host of This Week in Virology, host of This Week in Parasitism. And he's the author of a book called Principles in Virology. <laughs> he's got it sitting right in front of him. Uh, That's right. I do. I do. Right and here. he runs a very cool <laughs> operation called uh, Microblog, uh, micro, microworld.org. Uh, so welcome to the show. It's- hey, Mark. It's great to be back. It seems like I was just here yesterday. <laughs> well, actually, uh, we can. Uh, when, when was that out? Last show. You, uh, so you, you did a show with us with uh, Carla Kierkegaard. Yeah, it was the show before last, show. yeah. Was great, yeah. Um, she was pretty amazing. And uh, it was good to have someone that's uh, uh, pretty attractive as well. On the show. <laughs> but I won't it's, go there. You're talking, about, <laughs> you're talking about me, right? That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, so uh, you had a great suggestion. And uh, you thought that it might be a, a fun idea to bring your guest, or your, your, your co-host of... Uh, Twiv and This Week in Parasitism on the show. Yeah. And I thought that was a great idea because he's done some pretty forward thinking and had a significant effort at getting those ideas out uh, into the media. As a matter of fact, he's been featured on uh, Colbert, on John Stewart as well. No. No, okay. Not John Colbert. Stewart. Not yet. Time Magazine. Time Magazine. Yep. <laughs> So, and this week, uh, um, uh, American Scientific American as well, they, they did a, a, um, a piece on your work on the vertical farm. So, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about that. Um, and you are also a professor in environmental health sciences at Columbia and a professor in the Department of Microbiology, a College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University as well. So, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I thought... You know, we could divide the show up into uh, a couple of different parts. And, and the first part being, um, you know, talk a little bit about your career in parasitology, uh, <laughs> which is 
could end up being the goriest fib ever. <laughs> I'm hoping we're going to get some of those stories. Um, and, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the vertical farming. And we, I'd also like to talk about uh, some of the podcasting because you guys have uh, uh, two great podcasts. And, um, oh, thanks. And I, I think they're, they're a definite of interest to our audience, to the fib audience. Um, I listen to them. And it's, so it's kind of fun to be talking to the person who's usually in the little box. And uh, so it's, it's, although it may be a little bit of insider baseball, um, I think it, it, there's a, a great crossover in our audiences. <laughs> so it's, it's um, you know, really, it's about building a community of people that, uh, where we can get great science podcasting. So we'll, we yeah. can finish off with that. Um, so let me ask you first, what is par parasitology? What's, <laughs> that's probably what does that field anyway? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, if I were to start all... as a graduate student. It How started for me uh, back in 1962 uh, when I graduated from undergraduate uh, college. Uh, Fairleigh Dickinson was my undergraduate degree in biology. I didn't uh, have a clue as to what I wanted to do, and I had a difficult time finding a job because it was uh, during the height of the draft for the Vietnam War. And I was lucky to get an invite to come over to Columbia to interview for a job, which... Uh, they claimed they had already found a, f a person for it, but by the time I came by bus from where I live to the university campus, they had found some more money, and so they agreed to hire two people, <laughs> wow. which was extremely uh, fortunate for me. And so I began working as a technician in a parasite diagnostic laboratory headed by Dr. Harold W. Brown. And... Um, <clears throat> the rest is sort of uh, history. It was a, such an interesting field to begin with, and I, I had taken the, co the subject as an undergraduate, but I'd never actually seen how you perform parasitology. So I was there as a technician learning all of the uh, rudiments of how you diagnose, and then, of course, Dr. Brown would share with us how you treat these patients. And so we had a free clinic that people could walk in off the streets and uh, get diagnosed because we had a big influx of people from Puerto Rico at that time. And they had a lot of parasites, and uh, we were able to diagnose uh, a tremendous number of people's uh, illnesses or potential illnesses in the laboratory. And so I really felt that I was doing a very uh, useful thing with my life at that point. And in the afternoons, we would spend uh, working with the PhD candidates on their research and assisting them in their work. So it uh, gave me insight into both uh, the practical aspect of parasitology the study of parasites, multicellular parasites and single-cell parasites as opposed to bacteria or viruses, which is the other part of parasitism, and, um, and the way the research is carried out at the same time. So I got a, a, good, a good flavor for both of those aspects of uh, a field that eventually attracted me into it. And uh, I pursued my master's at Columbia after that, which I obtained, and then I went on to uh, the University of Notre Dame, where I got my Ph.D., and ironically, I got it working on animals that don't have any microbes. So I guess maybe I got my degree in <laughs> a microbiology. <laughs> so, um, but I, I truly enjoyed the experience. And then I spent three years at the Rockefeller University, which was the really defining moment for my uh, scientific career. I met so many interesting and wonderful people there that uh, still haunt my memories of uh, what it's like to conduct first-rate research. And uh, I was very fortunate to be a part of that. Rockville so is an incredible am. spot. Definitely an incredible spot. Yeah, amazing. Um, and uh, I met so many people that um, name, shared name with one me. of them. Name one of them. Well, uh, one of them was Christian de Duve, who uh, received a Nobel Prize for studying peroxisomes and lysosomes and mm -hmm. studying uh, the biochemistry of how they interact with all of the other parts of the cell. I met uh, a guy by the name of George Pilati, who I've got another Nobel Prize for the same <laughs> kind of approach to looking at the structure through the electron microscope. Um, Rene Dubose, who became a friend uh, and befriended so many people, uh, an ethicist and a, a wonderful human being and uh, also a great scientist. So uh, it's a lot of his influence actually has stayed with me on this. And, uh, I, Did I'll you ever meet Philip Mahl over there? Who? Philip Mahl, he was an electron micro microscopy specialist. Philip Mahl. No, I don't uh, think so. Yeah. Philippe. When was uh, he there? He was with Pellade, uh, Pilati. I can't pronounce yeah. I never pronounce his name. And uh, I'm academically uh, related to him. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and he's no, like the I've, father of microbi or, or cell biology, so I should uh, He might have funny. come after I left. I was there from nineteen sixty seven to nineteen seventy, so that was back in the old days. 
That was just after DNA was discovered as the genetic material. <laughs> so <laughs> so I you, actually went so to school. Seen, we didn't know the answer to that question, so that's, that's, that dates me quite a bit, I think. <laughs> well, you've seen parasitology, I suppose, uh, clinical parasitology, you know, go through the revolution of uh, recombinant DNA work and stuff. Uh, so you've seen a, a tremendous uh, breadth of the science. That's right. Could you describe to me, like, when I guess when I think of parasite, I think of that, creature and alien that just comes right out of your stomach oozing. Oh, know. absolutely. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I think that, <laughs> okay. that's how you should think about it. They're terrible critters. <laughs> They're out to get us. You know, and, and since Vince showed you his book, I guess I have to show you my book. This is the one that I've co-authored with uh, three other guys that uh, all share a passion for this field. And uh, we conspired to bring this title, Parasitic to the Diseases. Center? To the center? Uh, uh, Dick? Yeah. How's that? Yeah, yeah, it's great. Better? Paras uh, parasitic disease. It's in its fifth edition, by the way. We're very proud of that fact. And I actually published this myself because I own this little company, Apple Trees Productions. So oh, cool. Bob Guads at the NIH, Peter Hotez at uh, George Washington University, and uh, Charles Canarsh at Pfizer, uh, together with myself, um, put this book together to bring the current information to clinicians as to what to do about these parasites. I just want to point out, before you go on, this De Pommier and apple trees, that's the uh, connection there. Right? That's right. The apple tree in French translates to De Pommier. So, Except there would be an S on De Pommier, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so um, in that book, I suppose when you grab it, there's the, the, some of the gory pictures, right? That oh, oh, you know, the them. graduate students oh. are like, oh my God, I don't that's ever right. want to go to that country. That's um, it. Well, uh, that's too bad because you've got to go. Uh, that's how you, you <laughs> well, yeah, it. sometimes you do. Um, we set, I actually run a program called Medical Elective in the Tropics for fourth year medical students. And uh, they've gone all over the world. And, you know, forearmed is forewarned. And this sure. book will tell you what to do in order to avoid those infections. So I always give a couple of copies to them to give to people where they're going so that they'll have the same information. Yeah, the uh, illustrations here are very, very gory, and we can't show them on this uh, <laughs> oh, broadcast. But here, for example, is uh, very typical of this book. It has a life cycle. Yeah. Uh, of, of a particular, what do we have here? Uh, this is Taenia. Taenia saginata. Yeah, that's a tapeworm, right? It is. I have learned by listening to you. <laughs> so we have a, a nice life cycle here. And then we have a picture here of beef wellington. That's right. Oh, God. Which is how you get, which is how you get that, by <laughs> eating raw beef, right? always, but of course uh, <laughs> it's possible. Let's put it that way. And parasites are there to take advantage of us and um, in fact all the ecologists know that parasites are the limiting factors for population control so if without parasites this place would be a mess really so i, I never thought of it as a natural form of population control it's certainly not a pleasant one um it's not a, unless it's, are there pleasant parasites <laughs> well i can think of a couple that uh, are mildly parasitic that uh, perhaps some of your listeners might and viewers might want to catch presuming that they have a weight problem. And uh, one of them is Giardia lamblia, which uh, is well known to cause weight loss. But there's a downside to that too, and that is that after you get rid of the parasite, you have a rebound gain of weight that goes beyond the weight that you oh, were wow. before you caught Giardia. So, you know, it's kind of a no-win situation in that sense. So, but it, I, I guess these, these parasites are, are, you know, fairly alien to what people traditionally think about when they think about animals. Uh, do you have a favorite um, parasite in terms of biology, unique biology? I one that's, do I? Well, I, yeah. Can you describe its life cycle as well? I spent 27 years working on a single parasite, uh, the name of which is pretty familiar to most people. It's called Trichinella spiralis. It causes a disease called trichinosis or trichinellosis. Uh, it's found all over the world in various species. It's got about eight different species associated with this group. Uh, it's transmitted from person to person or from animal to animal by the eating of raw, undercooked, infected meat. And I worked out the details of its life in terms of how it spends its time in your muscle. How does it actually sit there for 30 years up to some... Some people um, can harbor this thing up to 30 years before the worm actually dies. How does it maintain itself in face of the huge amounts of immune system armatures that we have to bring to bear against this? We have T cells, we have B cells, we have antibodies, we have uh, antibody-mediated cell 
destruction of cells. We have all kinds of immune mechanisms to take care of these things. And yet, this parasite, once it's in your muscle cell, stays there and stays there for up to 30 years. So, um, Why 30 years? Is that, how does it know well, when to come out? Up to, th well, you have to die first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, because you're sort of a dead end host in this one, unless you're a bunch oh. of rugby players <laughs> in the Andes. Uh, <laughs> but people don't usually ingest people meat. So um, animals, though, transmit it to us because we hunt and gather, obviously. And so mm -hmm. hunters can bring this back in the form of a cougar or a black bear or a grizzly bear share it with their friends and um, transmit trichinosis at the same time. But um, up in Canada, for instance, the Eskimos, the Eskimo populations of Canada uh, often have outbreaks of this disease because, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but their name in their own language means raw meat eater. So sure. the word Eskimo means raw meat eater. And uh, eating a polar bear is is inviting in the parasite, basically, because uh, the, almost every polar bear has this infection. That's how widespread it is. Wasn't so, there an expedition where the there was. manual died of trichinosis? Andre, Andre's expedition. Um, but there was a recent article in the New Yorker magazine that disputed why they died. Um, I recommend reading that article, by the way. It was a nice summary of the expedition. But there was also a book about Andre's expedition, um, and it's on our website. With your, if you go to trichinella.org, you can actually look up the history of the discovery of trichinella and how it came to be known. And uh, one of the stories is about how Andre and his men um, presumably died from eating raw polar bear meat. What does uh, so trichinella look favorite. like? That's, that's my favorite organism. I, I love trichinella. I love talking about it. So if you want to waste a couple <laughs> of hours of your time, I can go sure, on. Sure, sure. No, I, this, this is... The thing is, the, I mean, these parasites are literally the aliens in the movie Aliens. It's, it's the, yeah. They've got the most funky biology where they have to live in someone. You're and then they right. sit there and, and form a, a yeah. tremendous cyst or some kind of way That's to true. prevent. Um, and they, they interact with us in an incredibly uh, intimate way. Uh, what does trichinella look like? Is it, a, is it a worm? Is it a flat worm? Is it a... It's a nematode. So it's a non-segmented roundworm, and it's barely visible to the naked eye. It's about a millimeter and a half long as a worm that's coiled up in your muscle tissue, and that's the stage that's passed on to the next host when this muscle tissue gets eaten. What uh, happens to your you, muscle when it's well, got the worm? Yeah, well, that's a good question. That's what I wanted to know. What happens to your muscle? I mean, why do animals still run around as though they've got no infection? when some of their muscle tissue has been compromised by a worm that you can actually see with your naked eye. And the answer turns out that this worm wants you to live a long and healthy life and then die. <laughs> and then once you die, of course, all the meat in nature is usually eaten by scavengers. And that's how you transmit this from one animal to the next. So uh, it actually offers some advantages of being infected. And one of them is that it, it heightens your immune response in general. Wow. And um, that's right. So there have been a lot of studies about if an animal has trichinella, is it now more or less susceptible to another infection? And in many cases, it turns out to be less susceptible to those other infections as a result of the fact that this worm boosts in a nonspecific way, like uh, BCG boosts your immune system, for instance. Sure. Trichinella does the same thing. And um, <laughs> there's almost a, you could almost say that there's an advantage to having a little bit of trichinosis. So and, came, and you said uh, it's a nematode. It is. So it's very closely related to the, the work, uh, I mean, to, to the organism we talked about with um, uh, another uh, Columbia professor, um, Marty Chalfie. We did oh, two yeah, episodes Saint with him. Marty and I are good friends. We, we, we love each other. <laughs> In fact, I have a great anecdotal story for you. Uh, sure, when Marty, sure. When Marty um, learned that he had won the Nobel Prize, Marty was uh, in his office, and he was... Um, opening up his computer, and he turned on Yahoo News. Of course, that's his first item of business in the morning. And he said he read his name. <laughs> yeah. so three Nobel Prize winners were announced today in uh, Sweden for having discovered the use of this fluorescent green protein that, that Marty is so famous for. And meanwhile, I was laying in bed at home with my wife, listening to the National Public Radio Station in New York City, announce the same information only about... A half hour, or when it must have been about an hour earlier, and mm -hmm. it says Martin Chalfie of Columbia University wins. And I, oh my God, a good friend of mine just <laughs> no surprise. So I go to work, 
And I'm so excited for him, you know, that I called him up, and I called him up five seconds after he opened his computer to find out that he had won. Now, why didn't he hear from the Swedish Nobel Prize Committee? Because he was <laughs> fast asleep, and he didn't answer the telephone. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, so now I've got Marty on the telephone, and I'm the very first person in the whole world to say, Marty, congratulations, you deserve it. You have a wonderful, wonderful scientific career. This is a fabulous prize for you to get. And all we could do was scream at each other in the telephone because we both of us couldn't believe the news. And it was just so wonderful to share that moment with him because I've had a similar <laughs> um, moment when Christian de Duve was uh, announced as the Nobel Prize winner. And I told you I was in his lab. I was a year out of his lab when the prizes were announced that uh, had his name on it. And I had a rare privilege of being able to call him and uh, tell him that I really... Uh, well, he, he won because of you, because you're nah. winning. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. No, you, no, oh, please, oh, don't uh, spread bad rumors here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he was working on a worm, um, uh, <laughs> nematode, and that, that's, that's what sort of got us in, onto the story, is that uh, uh, C. elegans is a soil worm that... I'm looking at pictures of trichinosis here, and it's very, very, very similar. It's yeah, about the size it of a comma. It's a little see-through worm. Um, yeah, but he won because he used GFP, green fluorescent protein, yep. um, as a biomarker to watch proteins get made, follow yeah. them through the life cycle of the protein within the cell, and then, uh, you know, watch the entire life cycle and what they're doing and where they're doing it using the worm. It's an incredibly see-through little worm. So, yeah. so if people want to get to find out a little bit about more, more about trichinosis as well, they can listen a, a bit to, uh, to what he does and get an sure. idea. Also, um, Cynthia Kenyon from episode 36, who's studying aging, um, was managed to get a, a nematode yeah. worm to live five times longer, which sure. I guess is a major engineering achievement to expand a, an animal's lifespan by fivefold, which could translate right. to us. That's right. Um, so Dick, but, uh, uh, <laughs> nematodes... C. elegans, trichinella are quite related. They are. Right? So why does one cause disease in us and the other is harmless? I don't think that's a valid question, Vince. You don't think so? <laughs> no, because I can't answer any why questions. I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer one of them. But I can answer how. I can give you a how, okay? But uh, let's say you think they're related to each other, but when you look at the genes, by the way, Mm -hmm. There are a number of uh, conserved genes that everyone calls housekeeping genes that take care of all the day-to-day -day, uh, jobs of the cells, the, the ones that Christian de Duve was looking at. And then there are these uh, specialized genes, which differentiates free living from parasitic organisms. So I have a question for you before I answer your question. And my question is, if you had to guess which organism had more genes the free living worm or the parasitic worm? Which one you? No. Which one do you think has more? Well, I think you asked me this on Twitter. <laughs> I did once, already. That's you know. not fair, then. So I, I thought by makes sense that the parasitic would have fewer genes because it depends on the host. But it, it turns out that they have more genes. They right? have many more genes. Yeah, you know, they have forty percent more, in fact. And the remarkable conclusion is that they have to do more than a free living organism because they they live in a very hostile environment. And so they have mechanisms for coping that the free-living worms don't have to even put up with. Yeah. Don't and, they have a life uh, cycle that requires multiple morphologies as well? So they need genes to encode for an entire new morphology? You well, know, the, all nematodes go through the same four stages. So I think okay. in that sense, they have an egg and then a first stage, a second stage, a third stage, a fourth stage larva, and an adult. That's okay. the Cenorhabditis life cycle pattern, and that is also for trichinella. But you're absolutely right in that the life cycle of trichinella takes mm -hmm. place in many different parts of the body. And mm -hmm. Cenorhabditis elegans lives in the soil and eats bacteria. So there's a huge difference in lifestyles. When they're, by the way, when they're at 30 years old, uh, yeah. are they dormant? Or is it, I mean, Good I guess question. they're a dormant cyst? Mark, Mark, it's a great question because on our website, uh, trichinella.org, you can actually see a movie that we made of a cremaster muscle preparation, which is the muscle tissue that surrounds the testicles of a male mouse. And if you exteriorize this uh, with its circulation intact, it's only two muscle layers thick. Mm -hmm. It's got uh, perpendicular muscle fibers that run in, in opposite directions. And some of those fibers were infected during the course of the infection so that you can actually look at a living, intact, live, trichinella larva inside of its own house that it's built called the nurse cell. And 
it's quite interesting. This worm is not a silent partner. It is actually moving around inside this uh, nurse cell, as we've called it. And it's, it's probing its environment the whole time it's inside, looking for, I guess, chinks in the armor, perhaps. And it, 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 <laughs> it can sense its environment. It's not in a liquid or anything. It's, it's embedded in a series of very interesting cellular manifestations of, the, of this nurse cell, which are all host-derived, by the way. What? So the parasite somehow engineers, that's what I ended up working on. How does this parasite build itself its own home? out of host tissue and keep it alive, which is even more remarkable. So the sure, parasite... telling the mouse testicle to form <laughs> a special type of or cell. Or the muscle. It's the muscle, muscle. cell, but it, it's yeah, yeah. Itself, striated skeletal muscle. It, it goes all over the body. It's in the eye muscles and diaphragm muscles and, okay. and, and also in the cremaster. But we picked a cremaster because it was only two layers <laughs> thick. All right. So yeah, it does have some humorous aspects to this. I totally agree. Um, but you can actually see the circulation that this worm has induced. If this is the nurse cell, then there's a, a, a circulation that the worm has actually induced around it to allow for exchange of, of nutrients and allows to waste materials to go outside of it. In fact, we what's, devoted it. What's, what's that called, Dick? It's a circulatory ready. A ready, that's right. R-E-T-E. So you can go to one of our TWIP broadcasts and you can hear a complete description of this aspect of this life cycle. So I spent about 10 years intensively studying this aspect. And then one day I got a letter from the National Institutes of Health that said, your services are no longer required. <laughs> it actually didn't say that. It said you didn't get your grant. Oh, okay. And I, you know, I felt as though I had been kicked out of my own laboratory. I mean, I just felt like a stranger in a strange land at this point. I didn't know what to do. Well, that and brings us to the next stage. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you, you you didn't rest on your laurels. You you you've you've done some pretty amazing uh, 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 thinking here and uh, very forward thinking. Thank you. One before we get to that though, um, I, I'd like to ask you, as, as a clinical, when you were doing your clinical work or in your um, career as a, a, a you know in parasitology, what was the What's the weirdest, craziest thing you've seen? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> I have to ask. It's, it's going to be No, fun. no, Mark, this is a great question because I like to tell the story as to why I became a parasitologist, okay? This is why I chose this field. Here I am sitting in this laboratory for three weeks with Dr. Harold Brown as the head of it. I just got this job. I've only been there three weeks, right? And some guy off the street comes in. It's just in the middle of the summer, by the way, and he's got a raincoat on. It's not raining out. You know, now you have to be wary of guys who are wearing raincoats in New York City and it's not raining. <laughs> Something's uh -oh. going on that we're not aware of here. It's to show you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. And that's, he came in, knocked on the door, which was nice. Usually they don't knock on the door. And he said, can I see the director of your laboratory? And I said, um, what is it about? He says, I have a specimen that he might be interested in. And I said, um, sure, would you mind standing over here? And I went into the office of Dr. Brown. I said, Dr. Brown, there's a man outside that says he's got um, a specimen that you might be interested in obtaining. And he's always, Dr. Brown had traveled the world and had seen, he thought, everything <laughs> twice, <laughs> except for what was in store for him. So he comes out and he uh, shakes the guy's hand. He says, please sit down. And um, underneath his raincoat, he has this box takes the box, puts it on the desk. And he says, I think that what's inside your, your parasitology group will be interested in having. He wanted to sell it to us. And, uh, of course, then Dr. Brown asked everybody to come over to see what's inside the box. He says, it is, is it alive? He says, no. That was a good start. <laughs> it's not going to jump out and eat us all, you know, so it's not going to be alien or something like that, right? But... So, okay, so the man said, oh, well, let me show you what it is then. And so he unwrapped the box and he opened the lid and Dr. Brown looked inside and there looking back up at him was a shrunken head, a real person's shrunken head, like from South America. <laughs> the mouth had been stitched wow. closed, the eyes had been shut, the hair was pulled back. And there it was. All the bone had been removed through the nose. And this was one of those moments in your life that you will never, ever, <laughs> ever, never, ever stop dreaming about. <laughs> no, let's wow. forget. 
And here I was three weeks into this job and I'm looking at everybody else and they're looking at us and I'm saying, this is fantastic. (laughs) This is the best (laughs) place I could ever be. I don't want to do anything else but this for the rest of my life. And I didn't stop. I said, said, if this is what parasitology is going to be like, I want a part of it. Right. Were, <laughs> Being surrounded by the crazies. Life, my life. That was a crazy story. And Dr. Brown ended up saying, you know, we, we, this isn't really part of our knowledge base. Here he says, I would recommend <laughs> going down to the Museum of Natural History on 79th Street. Maybe they would be interested in it. Of course, it was contraband. And can't sure. Sell you don't parts, want to encourage no. the sale of shrunken heads. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not right away, at least. I mean, there was a law against it and that sort of thing, you know. So. <laughs> So that That's was my wild. defining moment as to what forced me forced me by emotional impact to become sure. interested in this subject. If that's the breadth and depth of this subject, I want a part of it. So that's what <laughs> cool. happened. Hey, let's let's take a minute and then we're gonna uh, after the break, we're gonna come back and talk about vertical farming. Great. I'd like to take a minute to thank Audible for sponsoring Futures in Biotech. Uh, they have over 70,000 titles of audiobooks now, newspapers, magazines, radio, TV programs, just a huge library of great audio content. And today's pick is 13 things that, 13 numeral, 13, so 13 things that don't make sense, the most baffling scientific mysteries of our time by Michael Brooks, narrated by James Adams. And th- the premise of this book is that, you know, there was, there's been a lot of, well, science is all about trying to ask questions. And sometimes um, people ask questions that can't be answered and, and they remain scientific mysteries and they only get solved centuries later. Um, so what the author tries to do is really key in to what are the most important scientific uh, questions that are, un- are, are as of yet unresolved and then tries to tackle them and, and make predictions as to what's going on in the future, what will go on in the future. So it's a, a really interesting take on, on science on the process of science and, of course, some of the the most interesting questions. So uh, if you'd like to download uh, 13 Things That Don't Make Sense, The Most Baffling Scientific Mysteries of Our Time uh, by Michael Brooks, you can head over to uh, audible.com forward slash biotech. If you sign up for the 14-day free trial, you get the download for free. And it's a win-win situation. So if you decide you like Audible while you stay and you keep the account, and if you don't, you still get to keep the the free audio book. So really, it's win-win. And so you can get that at audible.com forward slash biotech. We really thank them for their support of Futures in Biotech. All right. So now we can um, get back to, uh, uh, to our interview with uh, um, Dr. Uh, Dixon de Pommier and co-hosted by uh, Vincent Ragnallo. Uh Now we're going to talk about uh, vertical farming. And I guess my first question is, how did you get into vertical farm? How did you get the idea of, of the vertical farm? What is it? And also, interestingly, how did you get the idea? Well, I guess there's a segue between my, my career in the laboratory, which ended with that horrible letter from the National Institutes of Health, <laughs> in which I, I tried three times to get refunded and could not, uh, for various reasons, too. And I wasn't quite sure of what any of them were as none of us are that gets turned down, but I had six in a row. So I guess maybe my lucky number was uh, six and seven was out of the question. The the year I actually decided to do something different was uh, in 1999. And 1999 was a sentinel year for many things. And one of them was the West Nile virus. And I I have to plug another book. (laughs) So (laughs) what I did next was I, I sat down and, um, I actually started to collect this data for this outbreak of an unknown disease that was sweeping through upper Manhattan and the South Bronx and out into Queens and people were starting to panic and then by the time uh, July and August came around um, it was becoming clear as to what was causing it but um, people were beginning to react badly to the fact that uh, Gee, I didn't even know we had mosquitoes in Manhattan, let alone a disease that's carried by the mosquitoes. And um, they begin spraying people by helicopter with uh, malathion and all kinds of other um, insect toxins, uh, insecticides you'd call them, but insect toxins, neurotoxins mostly. And I, I 
paid attention to that story because I've always been interested in the ecology of infectious diseases. So I thought, I thought, well, if I can't do laboratory work anymore, if I don't, or maybe if I don't have the passion that I used to have for it, but I, that, that probably wasn't true, that maybe I should uh, tackle some other aspect of infectious disease research. And uh, so the idea occurred to me that maybe the environment would be a good place to start. So the West Nile virus uh, story emerged in front of me and I, I sat down and wrote a book. And at the same time, we did our textbook. So we were doing two books at the same time. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, I, maybe I should fill in some of my time with teaching as well, because I really do like teaching. So I came up with two new courses for our school of public health. One was a course in basic ecology, which I thought most school of public health students needed. And then the, the flip side of normal ecology is, of course, abnormal ecology. So abnormal ecology, what's that? You know, so we, I came up with this term medical ecology to indicate that if you damage the normal ecosystems of the world, there's a medical price to pay for it. Turns out somebody had already used that term, but in another way. <clears throat> My friend Rene Dubose at Rockefeller University actually coined that phrase to <clears throat> indicate the fact that if you could derive things from nature that help humankind, and <clears throat> one of those things is antibiotics. Mm -hmm. René Dubose discovered the world's first antibiotic. He preceded Alexander Fleming. Uh, he isolated gramicidin from the soil. Uh, gramicidin is a very toxic antibiotic, so therefore it wasn't very useful. And Alexander Fleming, Fleming followed that with penicillin, which is extremely tolerant of, because we don't behave like a bacteria. And so um, medical ecology became... Um, reversed over what René Dubose had intended it for. Namely, there, there was a negative aspect to disturbing the environment. And at, about halfway through that course, the students rebelled and said, we can't take this anymore. <laughs> this is, you're telling us that the ozone layers in the stratosphere are depleted and we're getting skin cancer increases. The ozone at the surface layer is increasing and therefore we're getting increases in asthma. Uh, no, we, we can't keep track of all this. This is just dumbfounding us, and uh, not that the information was overwhelming, but that the the mood that it was creating was definitely not an upbeat mood. And so they came to me and said, uh, and there were seven students in this class, we want to work on something more positive. So I said, all right, you know, it's, it's your money, it's your time. I'll accommodate any project that's got scientific merit that also fulfills your requirement for actually doing something good. So they, they came back and they said, a week later, and they said, um, we've picked rooftop gardening. We want to see if we can grow enough food on the rooftops of New York to supply enough food for New York. So I thought, that sounds very interesting. I, I said, I don't know anything about that subject, but let's break this down into its components and see how to attack the problem. So the first thing we decided was we don't know how much land the rooftops represent, so we'd probably have to find that out first. And so... The, they went to the map room at the 42nd Street Library, and each map is about this, the length of this room. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> and these maps have the architectural footprint for every building in New York to scale. We didn't have Google Earth, although they, if they had, they could have done this thing in a day, but they, it took them three weeks to come up with the number of acres in just Manhattan. And I forget the actual number, but it, it, was, it seemed like a significant number until they went to plant it. And I said, well, what are you going to grow? And they, they had to go back to the drawing board and find out what is the most energetic crop that you can possibly pick to supply 2,000 calories per day to 2.3 million people. That was their problem. And they identified <laughs> rice as the crop of choice. So rice is what most people eat in let's say, throughout South Asia and Asia and China and Southeast Asia, all those peoples are eating rice as their basis for the cal caloric content to their, to their meals and supplementing with small amounts of proteins. So <clears throat> they grew rice, and they grew rice on that amount of acreage on their rooftops, and they could supply enough food for 2% of Manhattan. Now... If you want to see angry students, <laughs> but they weren't angry with me anymore. They were angry with themselves because they, they tried so hard for a thinking uh, globally, acting locally solution and that had a similar negative aspect at the end. They still couldn't make a difference. And I said, no, 
That's not true at all. You did make a difference because you learned how to work as a group. You asked a scientifically based question. You went out and found the answer. It wasn't the answer you wanted, but you accept that answer because you used the right methods to derive the answer. And I said, you learned a great deal. In fact, you learned a hell of a lot more than I could have taught you over the same length of time. So I think you're way ahead of the curve. And I said, oh, by the way, you know, there are all these abandoned buildings out there. And why don't we just take the food crops that you've identified and and move them into the building itself. And, you know, we can grow them hydroponically. Sure. That was like a flippant remark made at the end of this course, at the last moment before they broke off and went their separate ways to their own careers. I'm not kidding. It was just an afterthought. And that afterthought stick stuck with me. And I started to share with my wife. And I used to drive her down to uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in Midtown, New York. And every morning we'd go down there and we'd say, well, I wonder what would happen if we made a, a farm out of that building or we grew crops in that building. And I said, vertical. It's a vertical farm. It's not a regular farm. It's a vertical farm. And we sort of just invented that term to apply to our conversation. And um uh, Next thing she said was, you know, when I was a kid, my mother gave me a book that you might be interested to read. This didn't happen right away. It happened about six months later because it was about a year before I got to give this course again. So uh, she went rummaging through this big pile of books that she had as a kid and found that book. And the book's title is Old MacDonald Had an Apartment House. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> and it's got a funny title to it, but it was written in 1967, and this book exactly says what we should suggest it doing to the students. Look, here's a guy who owns a building. He allows this farmer to come from the countryside. They put the carrots on this floor. Of course, they're growing through the ceiling. <laughs> he's got his cows in the next one, his chickens on the next one. He's, you know, he's got all of his livestock and everything else kept inside. It was so gross that all the tenants moved out and found other apartments. And the last page is a double page thing, and it says, even in the wintertime, though, when the snow was on the ground, the steam heated apartment house farm produced food. And there they were looking at the green grocer in the bottom of this wonderful apartment house that has now been converted to a farm. Wow, is right. I mean, that's the essence of the story. I should have been able to go to the internet and find this out, you know, just by saying vertical farm or tall building farm or skyscraper farm or something, but there was no reference to this anywhere. Nothing. I couldn't find anything. There are high-tech greenhouses and stuff like this, but there was nothing stacking them on top of each other to make this vertical. And nothing about urban farming and then in those days also. Urban farming was just a, a, a figment of anyone's imagination. So, so the next year's class got the project again, of course. I'm going to try to, you know, parlay this into something. Let's see how far we can take the idea before it collapses under its own weight. Sure. That was my thought. You know, Wait, it's I'd like to idea. tell people to go to, if they're on their computer right now watching, or if they're, uh, uh, they're listening and they're anywhere near a computer, to go to verticalfarm.com. Um, that is, uh, it's, it's just a really good place to listen to the, con while you're listening to the conversation, to see what, we're, uh, what you're talking about here. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> well, thank so you. Because... You started a second class. It's an incredible site, and the oh, design yeah. elements of the of your, so your structures are, are absolutely incredible. I mean, you, uh, this is the kind of building you want beside your 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 building in New York. Yeah. No, that's that's how it's turned out. Actually, I can I can tell you now from that I, that from that original flippant comment has emerged eleven years of continuous work on this subject for half of each of the semesters for this course called medical ecology, and every single class got bigger, and I had more groups doing more things, answering more basic questions. All of their reports have gone on the uh, internet, onto this website that we developed around, 19, around 2005. And uh, the guy who developed it, Steve Chen, deserves a huge amount of credit for it because he was working in my office at the time and did all the, uh, the uh, visual work on this. But all of those designs that you see were all solicited, hmm, I'll reverse that. All of those designs you see were not solicited by anybody. Those people caught this idea from the internet based on their random um, happening onto this website and said, oh, I, you know, maybe I can help this too. And so they sent me their designs. And I said, if you send me your designs and you do them in this format, I will then post them. And I will give you your own web page. So that's I, you know, you, doing. there's so many gradients to these designs. I, I suppose you could have like right. the, they're beautiful, beautiful buildings. One yeah. that's 100% farm. Another one yeah. 
where it's half apartment building, half farm, and where yes. you, you take your $2 million condo and turn it into a $4 million condo because you have a backyard, <laughs> right? That's right. You have a condo yep. with a, a, an incredible backyard. Uh, sure. And I suppose you could even apply this to uh, this, these, some of these designs to space stations. I mean... Correct. Well, in fact, uh, uh, it's guys... ironically that you should mention <laughs> that because last week I had the privilege of presenting these ideas to the United Nations as part of a symposium on water. And one of the presenters was a NASA engineer, and uh, he was uh, equally knocked out by these uh, iterations that you see here because some of them will have application. Some of them. Well, and NASA has a huge interest in this whole field of, of growing food off-site, so to speak, not in soil, but off-site. Mm -hmm. And so if you learn how to do it here, then you can do it on the moon, on Mars, uh, Alpha Centauri. I don't care where you want to go, but you have to learn how to do it here first. And if you don't learn how to do it here first, then you can't go to those places. So, cause... Dixon, do we know how to do it here yet? And, or maybe at which point in the development of this idea yeah. did you see that it might be possible to do this? Right. So, you know, that's right. I mean, Vince, you're asking the perfect question here because... You know, as a scientist, you don't have an opinion about these things. You should just ask the question and find out what the answer is by doing essentially the scientific method to get to the answer. So the, question, the questions are, what do you need to know how to do before you can grow food indoors? And that question had already been answered. Who answered that question? A bunch of scientists at the uh, University of California at Davis. They, this was remarkable because in the 1930s, they essentially perfected the conditions under which you can grow crops without soil. And they called it hydroponic because that's a Greek word for uh, living apart from or living in water. And here they were using dissolved nutrients as their fertilizer, in quotes. And the plants were very, very happy growing in a watery solution that they could suck up all of the essential nutrients as long as you provided them with the right temperature profiles and the right sunlight profiles, and you can grow anything you want. And in fact, there isn't a single plant in the world that can't be grown indoors under those conditions, as long as you know what their conditions are. This, so, so that's, go ahead. Please. I, I was going to, so th those are the, mo the important technological hurdles, right? What yeah. is the economic incentive? It's got to be economically <laughs> viable because if, if you can, Absolutely. I mean, I live in Ohio here and there's farmland as far as the eye can see, but I could That's imagine right. being in downtown New York, you always have to get across at least a 50 mile barrier of urban <laughs> life <laughs> That's and right. to get at least to deliver that food and then create a huge network to support yep. the delivery of a fresh crop. True. And we're not in not only crop, but animals as, as well, meat and, and stuff. So is, is there an economic incentive? But I, I guess I, I don't want to be too, um, you know, schizophrenic here. We should continue talking about the technological hurdles um, before. Right. I, or do you want, do you want no, to no, address the economic that, question? I, I can uh, you... take off on any aspect of this you'd like. But yeah, uh, sure. over the course of the last 11 years, since I put myself up in front to actually... Um, champion this idea, so to speak, but using all of the knowledge that the students generated for that. So I give them maximum credit here. It's a joint effort that uh, you're hearing about now. Every time I would give a talk and someone would raise a question like, well, how do you get light inside your building? And I would say, well, it depends on where your building is. You know, if you build these out of glass or out of some other composite material that's totally transparent, and if I put this building, let's say, on the outskirts of um, Abu Dhabi, in the middle of the desert, and if I design them in such a way as that they're long rather than tall, and make them maybe not 20 stories tall, but maybe five stories tall, and not so thick so that all the sunlight can get through no matter what, I could make this building five miles long if I wanted to. And I could have the biggest indoor farm that could produce crops all year long, conserve water, and not have an impact on the environment, to be honest with you, because this much land could be saved then by growing your food indoors. You so can that, recycle water, I suppose, completely like always, in space. Yeah, that's correct. This is, well, that's already been done too. So all the technical details of working out how to grow food crops indoors are all known. And you can go to a place like University of Arizona. They have a wonderful, um, it's called Control Environment Agriculture. Now you say, you know, you're right for Cleveland. Why would you want to do that? Because there's Ohio sitting right below you. I lived in Toledo for a year, so I know all about the farmland of Ohio. Mm -hmm. It's a corn and soybeans, right? And 
you don't eat the corn and you don't eat the soybeans. Those are all industrial products that are made into some value-added product. Um, it's not supplying food to your table, to be honest with you. Most of the food for your table comes from Salinas, California. And uh, you remember the big spinach uh, bruja when uh, we had salmonellosis in it, and then we had mm -hmm. another one with uh, E. coli 157, and I could go on like this because <laughs> food safety, I'm a worker biologist, right? right, right. So <laughs> this is, there's a connection here. There's a bigger connection here, too, with parasitology, and that is that most of these parasites that uh, we're afraid of, we catch by human fecal contamination. Mm -hmm. And human fecal contamination occurs whenever you use human feces as fertilizer, and about a third of the world uses human feces as fertilizer because they can't afford to use anything else. Wow. So this, this technology, if made simple enough and made cheap enough and brought to those areas, would interrupt the spread of all of these parasites without a drug, without a vaccine, Without much environmental interference whatsoever, all you'd have to do is pay the people to defecate in a certain place and say, I will give you a living wage just to defecate over here because it costs me a hell of a lot more than that than when you can't work than when I just sort mm -hmm. of collect your feces and do something with it that you currently use for fertilizer. I will incinerate it and I'll recover the water from it. And sure. in the meantime, Energy. you see that? That building over there that you see, that's where your food's going to come from. So that you can work in a, in a relaxed atmosphere under clean conditions and you can make safe food for everybody. So there's nothing wrong with that concept, okay? It's just that we haven't done it yet. The technical details of knowing how to do it are on the books. We, we, we're already, we have high-tech greenhouses in, all throughout Europe. Uh, many of them are throughout the uh, Arab uh, Emirates. We have high-tech greenhouses uh, in the outskirts of Winslow, uh, Arizona, uh, in the middle of a desert. 318 acres of, uh, of uh, greenhouse in um, and just south of Tucson, Arizona, makes the finest tomatoes in the country. <laughs> and they wow. recycle all the water. And so these, when you learn this, I mean, for the first time, I was very skeptical, too, and a lot of uh, reaction, uh, well, they don't taste good. Try to tell that to somebody who didn't eat less yesterday. Do you really think they sure. care how it tastes? Of course they don't. Uh, right. So you have to talk about those people because those are the people that we're really aiming this project at, the Darf, people who live in Darfur, the people who live in uh, Niger, uh, Malawi, um, Southeast Asia, South Asia. You, if you travel to those places, which I've had the privilege of doing in recent years and, and presenting this idea to them, they will tell you why they want it. They will tell you why they invited you to the meeting. Because we want to hear more about this because we want to do it, because we have to do it. Now, the United States doesn't have to do this. This is all true. But that having been said, I can tell you who wants to do it. Chicago wants to do it. Seattle wants to do it. Portland, Oregon. Uh, Newark, New Jersey. Newark, Delaware. <laughs> New York City. Well, We've had big interest from people with... Um, Deep pockets. So will, it, will this happen, Dixon? Yes, of course it will happen. Of course it will happen. Well, yeah. I can imagine in Canada, too, with a great interest in expanding, lengthening the growing season. That's correct. That's right. correct. And having lived in Canada for over 30 years, I, I, I know what it's like to have produce uh, at the end of April. Um, sure. And, you know, really, you know, you're, you're pushing the limit of taste. It's not, <laughs> the produce is, <laughs> is decent. I mean, it's fantastic compared to what I guess it could be, I'm being picky, but uh, compared to what we have in August, which is outstandingly right. fresh and locally right. grown. Right. Um, if you could have that year round uh, downtown Montreal, or, you know, if you're even further north, uh, you can sure. uh, create a, comp a complete environment. One of the things that I really enjoyed about uh, going, I went to Concordia University for my undergrad and master's, is that there was a, a tremendously large greenhouse on the, in the downtown, on the roof of the downtown building. Sure. And uh, in the dead of winter, when it's minus 40 out, uh, I would go, go up there and study, find a little corner, and <laughs> it would be uh, 85 degrees, balmy, right. Right. Um, banana tree hanging over a tree, you know, in, in, in a right. downtown. It became prime real estate. It was uniquely, I mean, beautiful views up there uh, on the top of the building. I mean, if you made a whole building like that, you'd have a, a sanctuary, a tremendous sanctuary. Well, that's the idea. That's exactly what we want to do. But Dixon, you said we don't need it in the U.S., but 
will there be a time when we will need it? Well, I think there will be because, I mean, it depends on if you're an industrialist or not. If you don't believe in rapid climate change issues, then perhaps we don't need it. <laughs> but if you do believe that the climate is changing and the growing seasons are changing and the weather patterns are changing and the crop yields are changing, which I think everybody does agree with, then, <clears throat> of course, we do need it. And so if you start looking ahead and if you ask people, uh, Mark, I'm sure you're aware of this too, that there's a huge movement right now for locally grown produce, for mm -hmm. um, fresh produce, for produce that is safe. And uh, this technology offers all of those things. And I can also assure you that we've now learned how to make the food tastes really good. Um, but it, it took a long time to come to that one because people in the beginning were raising crops indoors thinking that the consumers wanted crops that looked good. And I can make a perfect tomato. I mean, I can make this sure. tomato look, as a, but it doesn't taste like a tomato. It tastes mushy and it's it's not good. So you're a fresh farm. The flavor receiver was a, gen, a genetically engineered tomato to block yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the ripening, right. right? So they took out the genes to, that responded yeah. to ethane, yeah. I think it was. That's right. That's right. I think, yes. And then it became a waxy. That's right. <laughs> no, you a wax ball. Circles. You're going to chase your tail eventually on this one. So... There's a group, this Eurofresh Farms group, wins tasting contests with their tomatoes every year. And here's how they do it. And it's really simple because you have to understand why a tomato grown outdoors is good to, to eat. But not every year. Even outdoor tomatoes sometimes fail. And why? Because near the end of the um, harvest, as the tomatoes are ripening and all set to be picked, if you have a heavy rain that precedes that for two or three days or even a week, and that often happens in August. Mm -hmm. Then the tomatoes blow up with water, and it dilutes the flavor. And now you say, you know, last year's crop was so good, and this year's Jersey tomatoes are no good at all. Vince and I live in New Jersey, and, and they, there is a brand of tomato called the Jersey tomato. On, in years, though, when you've got intense heat and no rain, and then you harvest, these tomatoes are absolutely chuck full of flavor, and they're thick, and they're very, very difficult to cut, and they make wonderful additions to salads and sandwiches and stuff. So the group at Eurofresh Farms paid attention, just like wine growers pay attention to their weather patterns also. And now their tomatoes, they take the water away from them just before they harvest. And all mm -hmm. those flavonoid molecules concentrate in, and the sugar molecules concentrate in, <laughs> And now it's the best tasting tomato you ever want to eat. Now, now not all the growers do this. Those, those are not proprietary secrets, but some of them don't pay attention and others do. If they can sell their crop anyway, what do they care? But, but the, the ones that sell to the gourmet markets, the ones that sell to high-end restaurants, they all pay attention to this now. And so I think in the near future, virtually everybody will be doing it that way. So if, if uh, major American cities are interested, I can Im imagine on Lake Michigan having a whole wall yeah. of these vertical yeah. farms where yeah. they, you, you're getting the water straight from the lake. What, is the, what are the technical, technical challenges of, of, of uh, wastewater from one of these? I mean, do, do the fertilizers get spread? And maybe then you, you, you create a basin and use the, the waste to create algae blooms and use the algae mm -hmm. for carbon source for oil production? I don't know. What, what's the... Well, uh, the Eurofresh farms, uh, actually, all they're worried about is nutrient depletion, okay? It's called nutrient uh, film technology, NFT. That's the actual abbreviated word for this. And since this is about technology, um, <clears throat> the thing that makes it work is that you can actually make up chemically defined diets for these plants from mm -hmm. chemicals right off the shelf. But they have to be ultra pure. So you make them up just like you would for a cell culture. Okay, now sure. when you feed them to the plants, of course, the little bitty plants take up so much. A bigger plant will take up more, a bigger plant more and more and more. If they're growing in a row, by the time the water reaches the end of this row, the nutrients are gone. Now you have to replenish them. So you have to have devices that are stuck along in place that sure. register the contents of the nutrients values. And then you have to have other machines that compensate for that and keep the levels the same. And there are machines that actually do that. So you've got these chemostats. Flow. Yeah, you've got chemostats. So you can actually allow the nutrient flow solutions to equal the growth rate of the plants. And if you can put you these filter on, water that way, then can you sure. can you have this pumped into your your water supply? <laughs> yeah, <I> guess, <laughs> no, but it never leaves. It never leaves it. indoors. It's always kept inside. You see, nothing leaves except produce. The water is the, what stays inside. 
So they just keep putting nutrients in. And the water is collected by dehumidification because the plants will transpire it into the atmosphere. And you can just keep recycling the water through the plants and you pick the crops and that leaves. You have to put a little bit more water in, but, but it seems to work out beautifully. And, and it's all controlled. If you look at the International Space Station, they're actually got a little bit of that going on there now. Uh, they want a lot more of it. And you have to, of course, you have to recycle everything there, right? You, have no, you don't have a choice. But do you know that the last Columbia space shuttle that went to the International Space Station actually went to collect garbage to bring it back to the Earth? I couldn't believe it. So they have not yet learned how to do everything in a recyclable fashion, even at that level. Uh, they're going to learn from you, Dixon. Uh, they won't learn from me, but they'll learn from the they'll learn from the technologies that flow out of this concept into the reality yeah. of, of vertical farming. So, is it safe to say that once the first one is built, then the rest will follow very quickly? I would, of course, just like your cell well, phone. It's, it's just making like, money as well. Yeah, it'll make money. Uh, it'll make money. Maybe I can show you. Uh, there's an experimental farm that's online from Cornell. That has, it's a lettuce farm, and they produce something like 1,200 heads of lettuce a day. They can produce on an annual basis 68 heads of lettuce per square foot. That's the yield that they have for this hydroponic lettuce farm. Uh, you can look up the price of lettuce. It varies in where you go and where you live, but it's mostly around a dollar, a dollar and a half a head. It costs about 80, 85, or, or maybe. 75 cents to grow so the rest you keep yeah and you can produce that on demand by the way you can take an order three months in advance for lettuce and guarantee that they'll get it and you can and there's no spoilage from shipping there's no spoilage. yeah and you save a lot of fossil fuel like local. this and it's very local it's right next door you see it's happening first in very wealthy real estate. I mean, the, yeah. I mean, where the real estate is expensive, you also have a lot of people that could benefit. Uh, is this going to happen in Tokyo first? Or is <laughs> well, it? it's already happening in Tokyo. I can show you some of the pictures that I've got. There's, <laughs> okay, a, a, look over here. there's a basement rice farm already on, in Tokyo that is producing gourmet levels of rice for I don't know who's buying it, but does, I guess it's pretty, pretty expensive to begin with. But um, the price of this will come down as soon as we learn how to optimize all the systems. And, and for that, you need prototypes. And so the very first vertical farms will not be a production line vertical farms. They will be experimental vertical farms in the hands of agronomists and technologists and, uh, and lots of people that want to work on this. And uh, believe me, there's a huge number of people out there that would love to get their hands on one of these. When is this going to happen, do you think, Dick? Well, we're having a meeting uh, over the next couple of months with some very, very interested cities. And one of them is Chicago, another one is Newark, New Jersey, and um, we think those two cities might have a great shot at, uh, at announcing the very first project that's got a vertical form on it. So maybe this year? Maybe this year. Can I ask you, uh, Mark, we have time for one more question? Sure, sure. So the students conceived this idea, you push them along, and I assume some of them are following All of still. them are following. <laughs> so are. this is a great life lesson in a way. You, yeah. have, you have an idea, you pursue it, you are really patient, and it might <laughs> just work. That's so what, how, how can you use that to give advice to people who want to develop new things but are not sure how to do it? Oh, wow. Well, it helps to have a, um, a cadre of very, very bright people with enthusiasm. There's no question about this. Um, when you get your students interested in a project that everybody participates in, the lessons that they learn there are not necessarily the results that come out of that project. It's rather, how do you get along with somebody? How do you actually share knowledge? Uh, in an equitable, equitable way, and, and then how do you manipulate that knowledge into a report that reflects everybody's efforts? The best ones I, I know of are the uh, particle physicists. <laughs> you know, it's a two-page paper, and one of the pages is the names of the authors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that requires a huge amount of coordination. So, so we're sort of in that stage now of training people to behave like they train architects. They they train them in groups, they have studios, they have projects that everybody participates in. Health-related fields don't work this way, unfortunately. No, I was going to say research that we do does not work that way. No, 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 and yeah. we're not rewarded for it either. We're yeah. rewarded for publications with our name that comes first. Right. And that's a, that's a tragedy of the system that we have created for ourselves. Because that's not the way the world, the world works, basically. The world works on teams. 
So team efforts are what count. But the continuity of the team, you know, every year was a different group of students. But they took last year's results and improved them and built on them. So I think if you can, that's the luxury of having well, sometimes graduate students uh, do this yeah. for other other projects. But I think in this case, it really worked out very well. Well, I think they also had a very good mentor who kept them focused <laughs> and, and unselfish along the way. I won't deny that. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about oh, teams, I, I, I liked a lot of uh, you guys form a formidable podcasting team, uh, uh -huh. almost a, a mini science network here. <laughs> um, so you have two podcasts, uh, This Week yep. in Virology and This Week in Parasitism. Is it, um, would you mind telling me a bit, a little bit about how you guys got started? Um, I'd, I'd like it's to just, mention story. this to the audience because I think it'd be, it's of interest to the audience as well to, uh, sure. to check these science podcasts out. Well, a number of years ago, I, I have a long commute. I used to listen to the radio and I didn't like listening to what someone else decided I should listen to. So I discovered <laughs> podcasts. And of course, when you listen to podcasts, you listen to the Twit Network. And I remember at one point, Leo Laporte saying, if you are passionate about something, you should do a podcast about it. Uh -huh. So I'm passionate about viruses. So when I said, I could do this. And one day I was walking from my car and I ran into Dixon on the street. I said, Dixon, I have an idea. He said, let's have lunch. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Which you like to do, you like to eat. And so we had lunch and I said, I want to do this podcast every week about, vi just sit down and talk about viruses. And he said, sure, let's call it This Week in Virology. I'll see you next Friday in my office. <laughs> so we recorded and it started and we uh, get along pretty well. Very well. We know how to talk in to each other and ask questions. So Vince it is a off. gifted teacher. He's a gifted teacher. And so it took off and we started bringing more people in and we and our audience amazingly for an esoteric podcast has grown and grown and grown. So we brought some guests in and now we have a couple of other we have Alan Dove, a science writer, we have Rich Condit, another virologist, and we have guests now and then. So that was very rewarding because we have lots of an audience communicating and asking us questions. It's probably the best part. So we decided to expand it. I said, Dick, you've worked on eukaryotic parasites all your life. Let's do it. So we started this week uh, in parasitism. And that's mainly been Dick and I. But uh, there I'm asking the questions. Right. And Dick is the expert. So we, and a lot of people have said they like the interaction. So I think that really helps a lot. You have some knowledge. You have scientists who have worked in an area their lives. And you have to be able to communicate, which I know Dick can do. And you. Very well. Come on, you can And the so that's a good students. formula. So there's nothing <laughs> like t talking about something. There is nothing like teaching something from your heart that you've worked with. Here, here. We had a provost here years ago who used to say the best universities are research universities because the people who are doing research then go teach the students and they're the best teachers. Right? So that's how it got started. Well, it's a it's a great privilege. I mean, for people, for, for I, you know, I love to download these things, uh, your 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 shows because it gives you a, um, an Ivy League education for free. Right? <laughs> it is free. It, yeah. What's going through your head is what gets taught in your classes, and That's here's right. a chance that people yeah. can get yeah. uh, Columbia uh, University education, um, finding out what's new and important in the the field of virology, and keep up. I mean, I could yeah. imagine when I first started in biology as a graduate student. Even as an undergrad, I, I, I guess as soon as I took a class that I could, um, uh, there was a lab course, then I could get back and, and teach that class to the next uh, n next semester. I did it. So, um, and then I was hooked into biology, I guess. Um, for I guess at one point I went through in my senior year a, a, an attempt to go into economics for graduate school and it was accepted but <laughs> had to pick a lifestyle you know, <laughs> banking <laughs> biology <laughs> wait a minute Any, um, Baruch Benassiaf was a banker before he was an immunologist <laughs> oh, <laughs> we know um, a few of them but it's yeah. a rare crossover <laughs> well uh, people in the field of science are, are very passionate about what they do and um, people who want to uh, you know get a, a first look at this field. Um, I mean, if I had heard This Week in Virology uh, back in 1992, 93, I would have probably uh, ended up at uh, Columbia uh, studying <laughs> under... Uh, well, so, many pe <laughs> so many people tell us that they, they either are going Such. into virology or they wish they had. I, some of the students in my course that I teach here tell me they took the course because they 
read my blog or listen to my podcast. So I wish we had this for more fields. That's the thing that there aren't enough specialists doing this. Um, and I'm always looking for others, but I don't find them. I want a scientist or some specialist doing a podcast that can teach me. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's a problem because it takes our time. Our, our job is to do research, for example, so this takes out of it. But I think you can be so powerful. You can get new people in the field. And as I, I told Dixon earlier, I think the measure of a, a professional is if you train people that do better than you do. And if we can do that consistently, and I think podcasts help do that, then I, we've, we've met our goals. Well, it certainly, and I think, will increase the number of people that are in science um, by, you know, making people, uh, sure. give, giving people a taste of it. And then, then sure. you're, you're stuck, right? Absolutely. Um, and and it, the, the cost of entry of listening to these podcasts is certainly cheap enough, so. Um, <laughs> you don't have to see a shrunken head to get involved in it either. That's right. No. <laughs> God, that's it's <laughs> pretty wild. Hey, I'd like to thank you guys for coming on the show. Um, I'll, uh, you know, f uh, our guest host today, Vincent Ragniello, uh, uh, professor of microbiology at Columbia University and host of This Week in Virology and host of This Week in Parasitism. He also has a textbook there on the desk, uh, Principles in Virology, which is a, a fun read. And if you want to follow a little bit of his work uh, in the podcast, it's always good to have that uh, that book handy. Um, you can also find him on micro, microworld.org. Microworld.org, yeah, is a science website put out by the American Society for Microbiology. And all of our podcasts are there as well as other great science information, all having to do with microbes. A lot of great stories there too. It's kind of like the yeah. dig for, for science. and Exactly. Uh, <laughs> some some weird uh, stories as well. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to also thank uh, Dixon de Pommier. Uh, professor of Environmental Health Sciences and Professor of Microbiology, College of Physicians and Surgeons, Columbia University, and also co-host of uh, uh, This Week in Virology and This Week in Parasitism. He has uh, three books, Parasit uh, Parasitic, Parasitic Diseases, The West Nile Story, and The Vertical Farm, The World Grows Up. And that one will be released in October of this year. So I encourage everybody to go go over to uh, um, Amazon.com and, and take a look at these. Thank you for coming on. Our pleasure. Always. Anytime. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the people behind the podcast. We have uh, Burke McQuinn, who was handling the audio and video boards today and the recordings. And uh, with him is John Salinia, who is um, um, supporting, uh, uh, supporting and training uh, work. Uh, I'd also like to thank the team that make this possible. Leo Laporte, Dane Golden, Colleen Kelly, Eric Lanigan, Tony Wang, Frederick Louis, and the rest of the team in Petaluma, California. Lastly, I'd like to thank Phil Peltier and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltier.